Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Theo Skubla, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, each one. Uh, in France, where I'm from, it takes 10 years for refugees and immigrants to find long-lasting employment. Here we're talking about 2 million people only in France. 2 million of people who have the right to work, huh, by the way. And thanks to my grandparents, who are Italian immigrants, I understood that our collective inertia is due mainly because of the fact that people fall into these two categories when we think about refugees. Those who want to help them, the poor people, and those who think that they are a misery we can't afford to welcome. In the two cases, we talk about poor people. However, I think there is a third way, one way that gathers all the people like us who are convinced that whatever their qualifications, whatever their origin, whatever their age, refugees represent a wonderful untapped potential. That's why we created each one. What is each one? Each one is a social enterprise that has this double mission to enable refugees and newcomers find long-lasting employment and to enable companies recruit those people who will make them stronger, more responsible, more resilient. How do we do so? Concretely, we offer training to recruitment programs that connect refugees and companies and that help the companies address specific recruitment shortfalls. Our main program, the All-in-One program, helps companies recruit 15 people to 20 people that are first trained intensively and ta in a tailored way by each one, and this is free of charge for the participants. Two important points is the fact that in addition to the training we provide to the participants, each participant is supported by a super coach that helps the participants alleviate the obstacles to employment, such as housing, health, childcare. We also help all the companies and their collaborators from start to finish so that they can freely and easily recruit the persons, but also train their managers so that they are ready to accompany the newcomers in work. In total, since 2016, each one, it's 3,000 people that found a job up to their expectations. It's over 70% of them who immediately find a job after the program. It's more than 40 of the biggest companies in France that work with us right now. It's also 3.4 euros of savings for the French state each time we spend one euro. And it's finally a team of 50 employees that is fully dedicated to the mission. And with our team and alongside our partners, we want now our actions to become mainstream. We are starting off the year strongly with the first strong uh, quarter, um, and we have ambitions to support 1,000 people just this year. To reach this ambition, we are lucky to rely on a strong demand on the one hand, but also to rely on a robust business model because 60% of our business model is self-funded thanks to our partnership with France Travail, the French labor institu institution, but also with companies. The 40 remaining persons are funded through grants, donations, like the support of THSN, for example, which are necessary if we want to help refugees alleviate their barriers so that they can remain employed, such as housing, childcare, etc. Without that, we can't guarantee people can be employed and remain employed. And this is why I'm standing in front of you today, because we need structural financial support to continue to do so and to continue to bring this holistic solution. That way, by 2027, we seek to reach the 10,000 people supported milestone. In short, you understood, we want no potential left behind, and we hope to do, so, to do that with you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Gordon Bardowage. I'm co-founder and director of engineering at a firm called Parity that uses ethical solutions to help improve refugee resettlement. 
As most of you know, uh, most refugees do not get a chance to resettlement, and even fewer get a chance to state their goals and aspirations along the way. Parity's team of technologists and social scientists are looking to change that by amplifying refugees' voices through the ethical use of tech and data. We're not just about resettlement, we're about granting agency, dignity, and pathways to self-determination. Parity began developing its platform on the heels of the Canada's Syrian crisis back in 2016 uh, through co-design with refugees. We, this allowed us to build safeguards uh, in the form of, um, it allowed us to build safeguards in the form of um, human, in, in humans in the loop that, uh, sorry, uh, allowed us to build safeguards in the form of humans in the loop that in, in critical decision-making junctures. How do we achieve refugee empowerment? So you do so through advanced pre preference matching algorithms that connect refugees with sponsors, services, housing, and communities based on intelligent matching, um, based on refugees' preferences and needs. But we go beyond matching. We collect feedback from refugees post-resettlement um, through rigorous monitoring and evaluation frameworks, working with organizations like HIAS across such areas as in uh, employment, education, and um, housing, key themes of this summit. Refugees are a driving force, shaping every aspect of our work. To date, our success, success metrics speak for themselves. We have um, resettled, matched and resettled over 300 refugees uh, globally in such innovative programs as Welcome Core, hailed by the US State Department as the most innovative um, resettlement program in over 40 decades in the US, or 40, 40 years in the, dec in, in the US. In rematch, uh, we connected Ukrainian asylum seekers with complex housing situations in Germany based on real-time capacity. Phase one exceeded expectations due to the high acceptance rate from refugees as well as stellar feedback from cities. And phase two is kicking off with focus groups um, with um, refugees and refugee-led organizations. But we can do more. So here are three ideas we have to further empower our refugees, uh, empower refugees through our ethical tech. So first, we'd like to enhance our data intake tools for ex to improve accessibility and inclusivity. So currently, our tools rely on our, our human and survey-driven, di survey which poses challenges in the areas of scaling and in survey fatigue from respondents. We're hoping to um, use emerging tech, such as uh, natural language processing, for, to allow for a more interview format with refugees, which will allow the ease and uh, reach of you, uh, uh, reach, ease and reach of our tools to improve. Uh, secondly, we'd like to align our matching with uh, skills-based hiring trends. Um, so we, we would like to do so by incorporating uh, global skills taxonomies into our matching algorithm. This will allow us to expand economic opportunities for refugees by leveraging their full range of abilities, a key theme of this summit. Finally, we'd like to use machine learning to reveal hidden data, hidden insights across our global, now global and vast data sets that we have. Uh, we'll do so by working with uh, ethical experts in the field to ensure the appropriate safeguards are in place and, um, you know, thereby, sorry, thereby mitigating risk. So through these data-driven recommendations, we're hoping to improve our policy and outcome um, uh, abilities in order to inform those. As it stands, our revenue is stable, um, be, uh, driven by our program impact and our matching services. Um, we're open to growth funding, um, also collaborating with impact investors, philanthropists, our, and NGOs who share our vision and values. Now is the time to invest in ethical technology, empowering refugees to shape their paths and create positive change. I hope you join us on our journey.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Said. I have traveled half of the world to join this discussion session for the five minutes, uh, not to deliver the uh, deliver something that we call pitch, but to communicate a vision. So, just imagine you are looking at the, the, your everyday's clothing. What's written on the tag? If it is cotton, there is a chance that 25% of the chances that that is produced in Bangladesh. So this is uh, Bangladesh really holds the largest ready-made garment works in United Kingdom and all over UK. But this story that I wanted to tell is not about the market where which I am talking about. This is beneath the market. That means the ready-made garments, when the rest of the leftover products really goes, that there the business came, came, uh, business case really comes from. So we are here uh, to share one particular uh, particular issue. The, the, the proposed solution that I'm going to talk about is called waste to wage. So this is a proven uh, concept that we already have started working together with the Rohingya refugee communities in Bangladesh. More than, where more than one million people are residing in the camps with 50% of the women becoming the uh, uh, victim of it. So this particular model that comes with a part challenge of challenging conventional economy, traditional textile economy, which comes with a concept of make, take, and dispose. Like then uh, thinking about the regenerative process, but it is more about uh, working with the circular economy. For example, where do the RMG waste or leftovers really goes? So there the process really starts. The modern model comes with, came, uh, comes with empowering the women living in the camps and at the same time giving them the opportunity and skill to work on uh, RMG leftover uh, garment product and converting this into the products which can, they, uh, can be sold. Because uh, uh, the supply chain is uninterrupted uh, as being one of the largest RMG producers and RMG leftover producers. So uh, this is an opportunity where uh, the uh, women from the refugee camps and the impacted host community, they can work together. Uh, one of the greatest uh, part of this particular model that we see that uh, the refugees that who are currently being very aid driven and aid dependent, this is an opportunity to give them a very uh, a second life and give the products, the RMG leftovers, which actually goes to the incineration level and produce a lot of uh, a lot of carbon dioxide emission. So this uh, we we can prevent this and giving the product a second life. Uh, in our prototype testing, what we already have done with uh, Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs support and one uh, donor support, we managed to create uh, 48 million uh, 40 48 tons of RMG waste, converting it into 0.02% uh, of the entire total market, building confidence of the 14, 40 uh, entrepreneur come uh, women, refugee women living in the camps. So that means they right now have at least 100 pounds, they are earning 100 pounds in the forms of stipend or scholarship because there is a protected crisis and government doesn't restrict, allow the direct money transfer, but they can get the chance to win the, uh, have the money as a, apart from the other works. And at the same time, this has a social benefit and environmental benefit of coming with 465,000 carbon dioxide gas emission same time looking for the confidence building and social cohesion creation because the host community who are also impacted, they're also looking forward to see that how, what is the benefit. And still, after all these things, it's 0.001% of the entire market that we are looking into. That means with the 30,000 uh, uh, GBP model, what we can do, we can ensure the uh, lively life and life skill development of the 30 Rohingya refugees are living on the same uh, camp, transferring uh, an opportunity and skill for them to earn 100,000, uh, 100 pounds per month, and with a payback of 12 to 35 months as a whole for the investment. We are looking for the impact investors to, to see the social benefit, uh, the safeguarding of the women who are not, restricted, not allowed to go outside 
the camp, work within the camp, and then still uh, get a kind of uh, economic support. So that's where we are looking at, and we uh, would be more than happy to see the journey together with uh, the Im investors and the brilliant minds in this room. We are also open to the technical solutions because it's a prototype. Right now, what we are looking into is to see that how we can uh, play the big chunk of roles because every single uh, pounds what you might be interested to come in, join, and uh, make sure that that is also being complemented by the other donors and other uh, funding sources that we are trying to tap in and creating a lasting impact for the refugees by challenging the conventional methodology because as you know that uh, sustainable is not only the term that we should be looking at. This is a time to rethink and reimagine or regenerate uh, the, the entire cycle and giving the product and the people living in the camps a second life uh, to make sure that we are coming with a regenerative way. Thank you. I will be happy to have you the more details if you're interested. Thank you. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the International Rescue Committee is looking for 250,000 uh, pounds to help us deliver our refugee uh, leadership program. We believe that decisions that deeply impact uh, refugees and asylum seekers should be uh, considering uh, perspectives of that category of people. Yet, in the United Kingdom, from housing policies to healthcare policies, policy makers do not involve refugees and asylum seekers in the decision-making process because people in power do not really believe that it matters. So our refugee uh, leadership programs is a solution to that problem. So what do we do and why is it important? Our leadership program is unique and worthy your support in many ways. We uh, put our services at the center of refugees. It is designed and co-delivered by refugees. And refugees assess the needs in leadership, and then the training is addressing already identified needs. And so uh, when we deliver these programs, we try to achieve one important thing, and this is putting at the driving seat those most marginalized people in our societies. So it's a move from the passenger seat to the driving seat. And our program has demonstrated already impact. Participants have already made some changes or influenced some decisions. For example, a number of them are sitting on our charities uh, refugee advisory board, where programs are designed uh, and are discussed. So they have an influence on what we do by designing services that are really meeting their needs. But more importantly, they have submitted ideas to the Haywood Prize and they have also been involved in some uh, uh, commissioned work, for example, uh, for the Independent Commission for Red and Impact, where they contributed a lot to look at what the, impact, the aid for refugees is doing in the UK. This program uh, is scalable. We have tested it. We have run a pilot project which trained 70 refugees as leaders. And these refugees have been involved into decision-making processes. They have met parliamentarians. We have involved them in a policy report that was presented to the parliament. We have seen them 
right at the heart of decision making. If we get a funding to deliver this program again, we are looking at providing or training 250 refugee leaders who will have a huge impact in their communities and therefore be able to influence more other people in their communities. Your support would ensure that those most marginalized in our societies are firmly in the driving seat and are able to influence and drive policy change that will benefit the society as a whole. Now, I want to hand over to my colleague, uh, a refugee journalist from Afghanistan, a BBC freelancer journalist, to tell you about her experience on the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emery. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Zahra Shahir, Afghan uh, refugee and journalist, and I arrived in the UK August 2021. And when I arrived in the UK, I had to embark um, both my per personal and professional life in UK um, professional uh, landscape. Uh, so I sought integration uh, through the IRC uh, courses, and I enrolled in a leadership course which uh, uh, this significantly boosted my self-assurance and equipped me with vital skills uh, for navigating in the UK landscape. Uh, and uh, it also ignited a, a profound commitment uh, to affecting positive change within my community and beyond. Uh, basically, I'm passionate about advocating for women and girls um, uh, especially those who are back home and uh, facing challenges due to the Taliban's new rules. Uh, uh, first, when I arrived in the UK, uh, I found it difficult uh, to do advocating uh, because English was a second language and I couldn't speak English uh, very good. Uh, so, uh, after attending the IRC uh, UK's leadership course, uh, I found my voice back and uh, I gained the confidence and ability uh, to uh, go through the uh, media uh, parts and take interviews, to do interviews and engage in public uh, speaking, including parliament, and uh, advocating for human rights and women's rights uh, worldwide, not limited to Afghanistan. And I thought that time to advocate for all women around the world, not only Afghanistan. So by challenging uh, me to get out of my comfort zone, it has opened doors that I never thought about it. For example, I stand on the streets of London and uh, conduct interview with public people uh, to ask about refugee rights in the UK. And uh, now I'm working with BBC and I had a fellowship with um, uh, Refugee Council in partnership with the University of Arts of London, as well as I had done some uh, interpreting courses with IRC, and I am working as an uh, interpreter now. Uh, uh, so I can say that completing the leadership course with IRC UK uh, fortified my dedication to advocating for human rights and aspiring me to become an authentic leader, uh, capable in influencing decision making and operating in senior levels in the future. Thank you. <laughs> 